everyone. Uh, welcome again to a Zoom discussion, which we have organized in conjunction with the exhibition Objects USA 2020 at the Gallery R and Company. Today's topic is Vestiges, a conversation with Tanya Aganiga, Katie Stout, and Michelle Millar Fisher. I am James Zamatis, and I'm the Director of Museum Relations at R and Company, and I'm one of the curators of the exhibition. And I'm broadcasting live from the site of the exhibition at 64 White Street um, here in New York City. I encourage everyone who is here to submit their questions during the talk. Please use the question section, not the chat group, and we'll try and save some time at the end. Objects USA 2020, which was organized under the direction of Glenn Adamson, celebrates the 50th anniversary of the legendary exhibition curated by Lee Nordness and Paul Smith with the sponsorship of SC Johnson and Wax in Racine, Wisconsin, which opened at the Smithsonian in 1969 and traveled to dozens of American and European venues into the 1970s. Our show and the accompanying catalog surveys American handmade art through a selection of significant historical works from 50 of the original artists in the 1969 exhibition and works by 50 of the most impactful contemporary artists working today, including, of course, Katie and Tanya. Our exhibition is scheduled to run through July 31st here in New York. Um, we're opening up rapidly here in the city, and we do hope to see as many of you as possible here over the upcoming months. Today's discussion originated with a conversation that Michelle and I had about how many of the artists in the original Objects USA exhibition have been on view in the MFA Boston's ongoing exhibition, Women Take the Floor, especially in fiber arts with artists including Sheila Hicks, Lenore Tawney, Kay Sekamachi, as well as an epic installation of Toshiko Takaizu vessels in front of a Joan Mitchell painting, which emphasizes the influence of abstract expressionism on craft in the 1960s. Michelle mentioned that she had been following the careers of several of the contemporary artists in Objects USA 2020, and that the pandemic had of course prevented her from doing studio visits and inviting artists to the museum. And in particular, she would have loved to have sp spoke with Tanya and Katie. So here we are. Um, let's, and as you can see, here are the ex here are the works by Katie and Tanya as seen in our actual exhibition in the gallery. On the left, Katie, and on the right, Tanya contrasted in Tanya's case with works by Joyce Lynn on the left and Tommy Simpson and Sheila Hicks on the right. Now I'd like to introduce our artists and one of the great and cool coincidences is that both Katie and Tanya are graduates of RISD. Um, Tanya is a Los Angeles based artist, designer, craftsperson who was raised in Tijuana, Mexico. She holds an MFA in furniture design from RISD and a BA from San Diego State. In her formative years, she created various collaborative installations with the Border Arts Workshop, an artist group that engages the languages of activism and community-based public art. Her current work uses craft as a performative medium to generate dialogues about identity, culture, gender, while creating community. This approach has helped museums and nonprofits in the US and Mexico diversify their audiences by connecting marginalized communities through collaboration. Recent museum exhibitions for Tanya include Disrupting Craft at the Renwick uh, in 2018, um, Craft and Care at the Museum of Art and Design in New York, Tanya's magnificent fiber work, Mend, which is about motherhood and community, is currently on view at the MFA Houston um, and is in their permanent collection. Tanya is represented by Volume Gallery in Chicago, and she has a host of exhibitions coming up. And I will try and post some links to them in the chat bar in a short while. Opening next week, Tanya is in a group show at the Craft Contemporary Art Museum in Los Angeles, opening later this month, Tanya has a work in a migrant rights educational exhibition at Mesa Contemporary Art Museum. And this summer, she will be featured in a group exhibition curated by Glenn Adamson at Friedman Benda titled A New Realism. Katie Stout, born in Portland, Maine, raised in New Jersey, is an artist and designer who lives and works now in Brooklyn. She holds her BFA from the Rhode Island School of Design. 
Um, Katie's represented by both Nina Johnson Gallery in Miami and R and Company. Um, her most recent solo exhibition just ended at Venus Over Manhattan here in New York. And she is working on a major exhibition for our gallery, which will open this fall, uh, taking the place actually of Objects USA 2020. Um, Katie has been featured in Art Forum, the New York Times, T Magazine, Partmento, Cultured, among many other publications. Her works have been exhibited in institutions, including the Dallas Museum of Art, the Museum of Contemporary Art, Santa Barbara, and the Swiss Institute. And over the past few years, her work has been acquired for the permanent collections of the Dallas Museum of Art, MAD here in New York, and SF MoMA. Our moderator, hailing from Scotland, Michelle Millar Fisher. Um, she is the Ronald C. and Anita L. Warnick Curator of Contemporary Decorative Arts at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. She has worked as a curator, educator, historian in universities and museums, including the Museum of Modern Art here in New York, where she co-curated the exhibition Items is Fashion Modern in 2017, um, at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, which is where I first met Michelle in 2019 at a preview for the blockbuster exhibition she co-organized with Colin Fanning, Designs for Different Futures. Michelle has co-authored many books, essays, and exhibitions, including her latest, the multi-site exhibition, Designing Motherhood, Things That Make and Break Our Births, one installment of which is opening tomorrow at the Mütter Museum of the College of Physicians in Philadelphia. So thank you very much for being with me, all three of you, and take it away, Michelle. James, thank you so much for that epic introduction. It was absolutely fantastic. It's so lovely to be introduced so beautifully and thoroughly. Um, thanks everyone to coming up for, for coming along this lunchtime. Um, I have about 10 questions for Tanya and Katie, who I'm really grateful. Thank you both for allowing me to be your interlocutor over this lunch hour. I'm going to keep an eye on time. I'm gonna try and keep our conversation to about 30 minutes or so, and then leave enough time for questions. Because I am uh, doing the PowerPoint, I can't see the Q&A as easily. And so James is going to interject if there are time sensitive questions as we're wandering through. And if not, we'll break in about 30 minutes and really invite questions from the audience. So thank you, thank you, thank you both for being with me. Um, we have the slide set up so that um, Tanya, your work comes first and Katie, your work comes second, apart from this slide and the next one but I'm going to try and go back and forth so we can have a conversation together. Um, what I'd love to do is for you to both introduce the work that is in um, Objects USA. Um, I feel like many people on the Zoom today will know your work really intimately, probably be super fans, but there might be some who don't. And so can you talk about not only the work that we're looking at just here, Katie, yours on the left, on yours, yours on the right, um, but also how it fits into or departs from your larger practice um, and whether or not you knew of each other's work before um, coming together for Objects USA. So um, Tanya, I'm going to start with you if I might if you can describe what we're looking at on the right hand side. Um, yeah, so we're looking at a weaving um, that is mainly made up of cotton um, and uh, the majority of it is dipped in a Mexican self-drying terracotta um, and then some parts of it are gold leafed. Um, and then a few little pieces are kind of left raw um, and it's all like marine grade rope. And in terms of your greater oeuvre, how does this fit in? Um, so it fits in, I guess, in terms of me working with fiber in ways um, that speak to my identity, but then also um, figuring out different ways of, of working technically um, in a like non-hierarchical non way in my studio um, where there's generally like no tools. Um, we work just with our hands kind of letting um, like our like ancestral kind of intuitive knowledge guide the shapes. Um, so it's almost like handwriting. Um, so everybody in the studio, which um, the studio is all femme, um, and so we kind of, as we're working on making pieces together, it's kind of like cooking um, where different people can just kind of come in um, and it doesn't matter, you know, what your educational background is. Um, we just kind of hang out and talk and let our hands like do their own movement without, um, I guess, thinking of them too much. Mm -hmm. 
I want to come back actually that that um, notion of non hierarchical is really tempting as a, a next question, but I'm going to I'm going to put a pin in that one for a second. Katie, would you be able to tell us a little bit about what we're looking at on the left hand side here? Hi, yes. So you're looking at my flower lady that I made for uh, Objects USA. And she is, I don't know, I think six feet tall. She's a floor lamp and she's made out of various fruits and vegetables and flowers. Mm -hmm. um, she has a nipple touch switch. So it's like a three phase and you touch her and mm -hmm. she's brighter. Mm -hmm. um, and this fits into my like, larger um, work. I've, I guess I, <laughs> I make a lot of lamps that are ladies and it started out as sort of, um, you know, like commentary on objectification by way of like extreme objectification. And I wanted to make these women that, you know, commanded a domestic space as opposed to like, serving it um and then they've like really totally evolved i I've, I've always thought of them as kind of like making themselves and each one has their own personality um and it's sort of like is the way i make things like i'll do a little sketch but then i leave things really open so that i i like allow for a sort of like an intuitive spontaneous process um anyway the fruit lady seemed like a natural segue um, just because fruits and vegetables are such a strong metaphor for gender, life, death, decay, beauty. Um, and that's how I got there. Yeah, I think about the emojification of vegetables too and thinking about sexuality and erotica. Um, again, I have another question that comes up um, and I'm gonna put a pin in it for a second, but um, I was reading this morning um, the conversations around using that language of objectification and the way in which in pop culture recently through the Britney Spears documentary and the objectification of women from the 90s on which which I think you know maybe we all grew up with um, it, there was a great article in the New York Times this morning um, that quoted Tavi Gevinson on the like the the ways in which we play with that and the ways in which people receive it which I think I'll come back to later but would love to ask you more about um, before I do that though can you talk a little bit about your um, aesthetics as artists. It's a very sort of broad and, and large question, but when I walked into Objects USA for the first time, when I've seen your work on display or when I, when I see it online or in a book, I immediately know that it's yours. You both have incredibly specific and unique approaches to the aesthetics in your work. And so can you talk a little bit about how you came to develop your visual language? I know that it's often spread out across media in some cases. Um, but when you look back at your earliest works, is there a connection or is there a pivot point where your facility with your media really sort of coalesced and became concrete? Or do you feel like maybe actually my experience of your work and your aesthetic is not how you necessarily feel about it? Um, and I'll do the reverse, Katie, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, so I once described my work in an article as naive pop, like six years ago, and it really stuck. <laughs> And now it, like, it's just like constantly brought up. And I don't know how I feel about that anymore. Um, but I guess <laughs> it's just like funny what sticks. Um, and I don't know, I like always think about the first piece of furniture I made at RISD and it was, and it's also really embarrassing because if you look at my page on Artsy, it says it's like the piece that I'm best known for. And I'm like, that's not even true. <laughs> but it is okay <laughs> no one's even seen it and it's just this like cow udder that's like spurting milk and like the milk are the legs of the table and then there's like a puddle of milk and it's all carved out of wood hmm. um but when I like think about that piece of furniture I'm like oh it's obviously like it's a mammary you know it's just like it's it feels like it weirdly fits into what I've been making um and so part of it I think I've always had like in terms of aesthetics like a poppy colorful like light-hearted aesthetic but it's it's sort of like I always think about comedians like they're really funny but it's also because a lot of them are like dealing with some sort of tragedy um and like a darkness and I think like that's 
I don't know. That's kind of like where my aesthetic comes from. How about you? How about you, Tanya, in terms of your aesthetic and, and the way in which, I mean, I know it's often across many different media, but do you feel that there is, there was an epiphany moment, there's a, there's a consistency that you um, recognize yourself? Um, yeah, and I think that some of the stuff will kind of, um, like in some of the slides, I think um, we put some that kind of reference um, like what happened. Um, so I, yeah, I studied furniture design for grad school and undergrad. Um, and it took me a really long time, I think, to find my voice and to find my way of working that was really like just genuine to me without um, being referential of other artists. Um, and a lot of that, like coming to that language came to me after um, spending time learning backstrap weaving um, in Chiapas in southern Mexico, um, studying with Mayan um, backstrap weavers, which um, are all women. Um, and so a lot of that just came out of asking them, you know, like, why do you work in the ways that you work, which is tying your body to a central object, usually in the home or outside, um, while doing like domestic things. Um, and they just like I had this really massive epiphany seeing how the body can be connected to an object and the connection of the body to an object and the material being a witness to that connection can actually be um, like what gets made at the end rather than like focusing, I guess, just on objects themselves. Um, and so then after that, I kind of have spent years trying to figure out ways of working that like decolonize my own practice because the practice of backstrap weaving is a pre-colonial Mesoamerican practice. Um, and the way that I had been taught in school was all through um, like Eurocentric um, tools and methods. And yeah. so, um, yeah, so little by little, I started to kind of carve away and almost like unlearn a lot of the stuff that I had um, studied in school to try to find a way that made sense for me in the way that I wanted to, to have the studio be a more communal space for women and for femmes. So I only have a very short time with you both and the answers that you've offered so far really make me want to dig into these larger questions about practice and about where you, how you have experienced the field both over the arc of your careers to date and today. And so I'm gonna skip a few questions. I'd love to go um, to, uh, I'm torn between two. I'm gonna ask this one first. Um, so what support or opportunities do you wish you had for your work that don't currently exist that you think should or that you wish did? Um, I often uh, uh, imagine a, a paradise that might exist for artists based on the work that I do in museums. Um, and it has to do with a lot more funding or just a lot different um, hierarchies in museums, a lot different staffing of museums. Um, uh, and things that I think could come to pass, but may not in my lifetime, which then makes me wonder, do I still want to work in museums? Um, and so I, I guess I'm asking, and it, it sort of ties to the second question that I had, like what concerns you in your practice right now, both aesthetically, certainly, but also politically and logistically in terms of very practical concerns. So the two large questions, what support or opportunities do you wish you had for your work? Um, or you do wish maybe others had for their work too? And what concerns you in your practice just now? Um, over a range of different um, uh, outlets. Katie, I'll, I'll go to you first. Um, one opportunity I wish I had was to, I, I really wanna make a sculpture garden. <laughs> I wanna make public artwork that like a lot of people can experience. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I would love to do. I'm really inspired by Nikki de St. Fowl's uh, tarot garden. Um, also all of her shows in New York right now are really great. Um, and then in terms of my studio, one thing that concerns me is like being based in um, Brooklyn, it's kind of, I don't know, it's pretty expensive and I feel like, um, you know, it's hard, I don't, it's a hard place for young people to live and I, I, I don't know, it's just, that's one of my concerns and I feel like a lot of, I would love to work with so many more people, but there's like a barrier between me being able to work with people in a weird way, just because of the location. Yeah. Um, 
yeah I I left New York three years ago and I'd lived there for maybe 12 years or so. I love it as a city because of the collections that are there. I was able to see things that were just, you know, as an art historian, so deeply wonderful and meaningful. I loved, and I, I, I would think it's still the greatest city in the world. I would come back in a heartbeat um, for many reasons, but I also loved leaving it. Philadelphia has so much space and was so cheap to live in. It was so fantastic. I'm now in Providence, which is a city you both know very well. Um, and I'm interested to see what happens over the next generation, because I think, uh, as in many cities, creeping gentrification has meant that, I'm not even rampant gentrification, among, among other factors, has meant that it has become a city that's more inhospitable to creative practitioners in, in many ways, uh, for very logistical reasons. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and I feel like I'm experiencing it in a very, I don't know, in a, in a way. Um, Tanya, how about you in terms of the concerns for your practice just now and opportunities or, or dreams that you have about work that um, you are yet to make and would like to? Um, yeah, so I, for me, um, I think just like capitalism and white supremacy as a whole is a really massive, like gigantic, overwhelming and just constant burden um, and obstruction to like the ability for our communities to like be safe and to even like sometimes, you know, think about like opportunities. Um, yeah. And so I think that, yeah, I mean, I just like constantly think of, um, you know, like as people of color, as immigrants, as, you know, non, like non-English speaking people, like all kinds of stuff that, um, there's so many different obstacles to even getting to higher education. Um, so I think a lot about like, is higher education even the way to go? And why is it that, you know, like success in the US is so connected to people having degrees and people having, you know, very large expensive, you know, tuition, um, which then like further keeps us from like reaching equity. Um, but then even that, like I think about you know, once you get to the to the place like where I'm at right now, then even like museums don't like collect things that aren't object based. Um, a lot of the way that our communities express ourselves or the way that we care for our own communities aren't necessarily through ways that are like monetized. Um, so there's just like a lot of issues that I think about in terms of like performance, in terms of things that are ephemeral. Um, in terms of things that I see as art, which I'm very much involved with that are more linked to like humanitarian rights and mutual aid and things like that. Um, so I think about how museums are not ready to like open the door uh, for people of color and how a lot of even like the materials that a lot of people um, are using in their practice now like dirt and different things like museums can't handle like what do you do when something is made out of, you know, non um, like collectible or non um, like things that they that they can't um, like control, you know? So it's like, even in itself, like the museums and higher education are very like white supremacist holding up, you know, like these systems that are just, yeah, not built for us. Yeah. So I wish, sorry, go yeah. ahead. Oh no, I just, I wish so many things. Yeah. I, uh, I have so much to say in response uh, to, to that. And maybe, I mean, uh, I am also first generation to graduate high school in my family. So coming to the US and just imagining the paradigm of people paying $50,000 a year to go to school was mind blowing to me when I got here. It still is actually. I don't understand that as a concept. Um, and yeah, working in museums. I mean, I think one of the things that you raised, which is really interesting to me, is about that opening of the door. But if you're opening the door to a structure that remains white supremacist and is really difficult to reimagine in any other way, um, uh, apart from sort of entirely dismantling it um, in, in order to rethink it. Um, yeah, I wonder if it's a, less about maybe opening the door and, and, and about dismantling or, or um, repatriation of resources. 
Um, and the one thing that you said about material, and we're looking here, I'd love you actually, because we've looked at, I've, I've skipped through some of the slides and I'd love to give you the opportunity to, to speak to some of the work that you put into the slides and then to do the same for you, Katie. Um, you talked about materials and what can and cannot be controlled or can, can work inside a museum. Um, and I think actually some of my uh, wonderful colleagues as conservators would be really eager to be able to engage more often with artists and, and to work to, to to, to make it possible to, um, I mean, acquire is a really loaded term, but to support work that maybe has not been historically cared for by museums, either in perpetuity as part of their collection or as part of display. Um, but could you talk a little bit about what we're looking at here and I'll flick through the next couple of slides as well. Um, and maybe specifically about the, the many ways in which your practice has engaged with the notion of um, borders and artistic and community exchange. Yeah, um, so the image on the left is an image of me, I think it's in 2008, um, learning backstrap weaving. Um, and this is with my teacher Rosa, who's a Mayan woman um, who does, who practices backstrap weaving. So the blanket in the back is actually all backstrap woven. Um, and so that's what I was referring to earlier. Um, so it's a, a loom that you attach to your, your back and then the other part of the loom is attached to a pole. Um, in this case, this, the pole was in the middle of Rosa's house, uh, which the house was just one room. Um, and so then by you pulling your body back, um, you create the tension um, in order to be able to have a, a stiff warp um, that you can weave in and out of. Um, and so then on the other side, on the right, is an image of myself and um, my friend and collaborator, Jackie Amesquita, who's from Guatemala. Um, and we are backstrap weaving attached to each other rather than attached to an object um, through the US-Mexico border fence in an area of, I'm in Arizona um, and she's in Mexico, she's in, in Sonora and we're attached to each other so that the tension between us two is what actually gets recorded in the, um, the weaving. And you're not allowed to pass anything through the US-Mexico border. You're not allowed to touch through the US-Mexico border. Um, you're not allowed to, to do what we're doing there. Um, but we did it in sight, in plain sight of um, a border patrol agent um, in an area that we felt was safe enough for us to try to do an intervention through. And this is a site that was held a lot of um, significance for Jackie. It's an area where she had attempted to cross four times as a young woman um, when she was trying to reunite with her mother. Um, and so it's a place that we um, it just held a lot of a lot of meaning for us and Jackie had learned how to do backstrap weaving in Guatemala, also with Mayan uh, weavers. And so, yeah, we just kind of wanted to, to record, again, our connection to one another, our connection to craft, our connection to identity through material and through craft, um, but, you know, being really specifically trapped and bisected by the US-Mexico border fence. Um, and the object that we wove, so it was a double-sided thing that we just left in place um, because we didn't want to, yeah, we just kind of left it there um, as a symbol of, of our intervention. Um, but yeah, but then in the end, what exists is just photographs of us, you know, doing this. Um, yeah. And so, so a lot of, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Tanya, I interrupted you. No, no, you, you go. I was going to say, so when I'm looking at work like this, and it's so powerful, it's very visceral, it's dangerous to make in some ways, or at least it's, it's, it's not within the um, studio, I don't want to say the comfort of a studio, because the studio isn't always necessarily a comfortable place, but it is um, a very different scenario making work here than to have it on display in a gallery like it is in Objects USA, for example, coming into a museum collection. And so I'm really curious, and I want to ask this of you as well, Katie, um, what does it mean to be in dialogue in a show with historical figures in Objects USA? What does it mean to be in museums um, with your work or, or in gallery spaces? I don't want to just say museums. Um, are the artists that you're showing alongside artists that you feel affinity with or had looked at earlier in your career or even now? Or is there a tension there that feels productive or maybe even uncomfortable? Wait, is this a question for me? 
Yeah. I'm, gonna ask, I, I'm gonna ask Tanya first and then Katie, I'm gonna come to you because I'm gonna look at some of your slides. So yeah, Tanya first. Um, I mean, I think honestly for a lot of, um, it's something that, I mean, it's a, sadly, I think a lot of stuff more than even being in conversation, it's an act of survival and it's an act of resistance. Um, because I'm unable to do works like, you know, like this glass piece, like the, you know, I spent three years traveling the US-Mexico border, zigzagging back and forth, doing um, collaborative works with community on both sides of the border, all of which, you know, was all self-funded. Um, and so I can't, you know, do things like that or pay for things like that unless I sell work. And so it means that I have to make things that are palatable enough or decorative enough um, that people want to live with them or that museums want to show them in conversation with other, you know, like historical pieces. So I guess that, you know, I'm, I'm aware of like where my work sits in like a lineage and where my work sits, I guess, in like historical context. Um, but it also is always, you know, pushing back and like remembering um, that it is a lot of the stuff is made in defiance to, yeah, to the, the system that I'm, that I'm, um, becoming complicit to by taking the money, you know? And so oh. then I just to kind of come to terms with some of it sometimes so that I can keep like paying for things like a bunch of tents that I have to smuggle into Mexico so that little girls can be safe as they're waiting asylum. You know, you just, yeah, you described a lot of my feelings working for museums. That's how you, so, so yeah, yeah. I mean, just to be real, like not, you know. I mean, I yeah. still, yeah, I like, I, no. I have to, you know, like you have to do the jobs and you have to take the money and you have to do it because that's how we survive. And you know, and as somebody that doesn't come from like financial support of any sort, and as a mother, you know, it's just part of the work, and it's the the choice that we've made of the work that we want to do. And I wonder if that takes us back to the question about what support or opportunities do we wish we had in the world? And maybe um, I do see I do see some institutions thinking about working differently, supporting differently, being open to different conversations. But um, yeah, I want to, Katie, I want to ask you the same question. Actually, this is a really nice um, image, a setup of where your work is in Objects USA. What does it mean to be, I mean, this only shows part of what is a really fantastic room also with Balkus and, uh, and Arneson and others in, in the space. What does it mean for your work to be in this sort of space or dialogue? Um, I, I, sort, I agree with Tanya, like there's obviously an inherent kind of conflict between, I don't know, uh, having to like sell something and wanting to make the work that you like truly, truly, truly want to make. Um, but I mean, in this, in this, I mean, it, it also changes like depending on the gallery and the context I'm for this show, I think for instance, it's I mean, like there are just so many different pieces and I it feels like more sort of like democratic than a lot of other shows I've been in, just how everything, like there's no clear, typic so typically <laughs> when I have a piece in a show, sometimes I'll like sort of diva dip and I'm like, okay, but is there a place to photograph it? So like nothing else is next to it. <laughs> and for this show, like I love how close everything is and like pieces are intersecting and like it feels like a real conversation and, and like a little party, um, <laughs> especially right now because I don't know, it's just been such a weird year and we've all sort of been isolated. I find this like really refreshing. Um, I'm, yeah, I think I also, I love when um, like my personal instinct is like, I love having like mess. Like I remember talking to R about my first show and, I, and they were talking about the install and I was like, okay, so this is what we're gonna do. Um, we're gonna bring in a bunch of trash and you like can't really see any of the pieces and you have to like dig through to find them. Um, and they were like, well, no, we're not gonna do that. <laughs> um, I, I have like, I don't know, a penchant for like, disorder. 
and um, like chaos. And I, I love, so part of me just like relishes like have, having work in a gallery because it's so controlled. Mm-hmm. Um, like the Dallas Art Museum or Museum of Contemporary Art, I can't remember the name. Anyway, when they, they got this paper pulp shelf and they were like, so um, sort of what Tanya was talking about. It's like not really an archival material. Yeah. And they're like, so what do we do when, if it like gets damaged or like starts decaying? And I was like, well, it's like paper mache. You just put more on. Um, so I think the conservator that is probably like a heart attack or at least a really long artist questionnaire to make sure that absolutely every eventuality is taken care of. I know that we're getting to, we're getting close to the moment in time when, um, let me see, yeah, we've got about, uh, actually I'm looking at my phone just here and I have a really, a great text message from a wonderful museum colleague saying, listening to the panel and I want to put um, one of my favorite conservators in conversation with both uh, Tanya and Katie about materials and she mentioned a fantastic conservator so if this is a conversation that you haven't yet been able to have with a museum conservator we have someone really uh, great who is excited to do that um, but yeah I, I'm going to use my last two questions or so and then make sure that we come to um, uh, some questions from the audience uh, can you talk a little bit about the the mentors or the um, peers that you owe most to in terms of the work that you do as an artist? I'm always really struck by super personal stories. Sometimes they're family members, sometimes they're people who you've met in educational institutions, sometimes they're um, completely different, but who the, the folks are who have really helped you um, become the artist that you are. Um, so Tanya, I'll start with you. Um, so my mentor who like changed my life and um, I think in doing so changed all of my students and my sister's life um, was Michael Schnorr, who was one of the founding members of the Border Art Workshop. Um, he was my film as a film as history of art teacher in community college. Um, and I, before I met him, had never gone to an art museum, had never studied anything art related. Um, I'd never taken an art class. I'd never held a hammer. I'd never held a drill. Um, And he completely um, like opened my eyes to what art can be. Um, And because the Border Art Workshop was really um, instrumental in, um, you know, coining the term border art, but also in using art as a tool to defend communities. he, you know, my time working with him, um, yeah, just really like turned me into the person that I am. Um, and he um, committed suicide in 2012. And after he passed away was when I decided to refocus my energy um, and all of, you know, my amassed knowledge um, towards the border and figuring out ways of, of combining craft and activism and um, I guess human rights work. Um, so yeah, so his name was Michael Schnorr. I'm glad to remember him. I'm really sorry for your loss, Tanya. I lost my partner to the same, uh, my former partner to, to the same um, about three years ago. And it's a, a really terrible way to lose somebody, but it's also something that it's lovely to keep their names alive actually, and to have their work live on in your work. For people who don't know, um, can you tell folks what the Border Art Workshop is before I ask Katie the same question? Um, just for a bit of context. Yeah. Yeah, so the Border Art Workshop um, was formed in 1984, um, and it was a binational arts collaborative of, um, in the beginning, it was mainly a lot of, um, a lot of performance-based artists, um, both from the U.S. and Mexico, but then also people um, later from, from other places um, that used art as a medium for talking about frontiers and about borders in general as a physical space for, for dialogue, but also as a like metaphorical space. Um, so, you know, really thinking about how to expand the notion of borders in everybody's um, like collective um, imaginary. Thank you. Um, we've got about eight minutes left. I want to encourage people to put questions in the chat or um, in the Q&A just now, but Katie, would you be able to answer the same question? Who have been the mentors or the peers that have really like absolutely been formative for you? Um, I mean, I guess my mom, uh, she, she had also gone to RISD. She was an art teacher. Um, she like never got toys from me. She's like, no, we can't afford it. You can make your own toys. So um, she just like instilled this like 
and she was so strong. She was like the strongest woman ever. Um, and she like made all the furniture in our house, um, mm -hmm. just really amazing. And yeah, I think she instilled in me like a sense of uh, like grit, imagination, creativity. Um, but then like also I have to say like going to RISD also was just like so eye opening and I'm so grateful for the community that um, I still am in touch with now. Uh, and it's really nice having peers that I can just like reach out to and like sort of like workshop ideas with. Um, it's incredibly valuable. Yeah, I feel delighted to live in Providence, actually. It is such a rich and amazing city for being able to, you know, throw a stone and it, it lands in somebody's design or art studio. Lots of amazing visiting faculty um, and really interesting conversations happening, always at the, the RISD Museum, too, a great collection and a really thoughtful way of approaching those collections there, I think. Um, James, I want to make sure that I'm not ignoring people's questions and I see some more happening. I can see some activity in the chat. And so what I'm going to do is stop sharing my screen. I can always come back to these slides if we would like to. Um, I'm very happy, Tanya and Katie, if there's a slide that I was sort of gently um, uh, moving on that you'd like me to go back to and take a look at in particular, all you have to do is say. Um, but I'm going to look just now in the chat. Um, Okay, so I'm going to take some of the very um, easy and, uh, and very nice questions from the chat, which could um, result in very quick answers. We were looking at a chest of yours, um, Katie. What is the media of it, Barbara asks? Oh, it's wicker with rocks woven into it. Okay, and, and the lamps as well. Oh, yes, with lamps coming out of it, yeah. Oh, no, sorry, uh, the, the medium okay. lamps as well. Oh, for the lamps. Oh, the, uh, there's... Well, the one at Arn Company is ceramic um, with a metal infrastructure. And then the ones, there's also a slide of some lamps that I just showed at Venus that are bronze, glass, and ceramic. Cool, fantastic. And then a question for you both from Rafi. Uh, what mediums or techniques have you not explored yet that you would like to? So I'll throw that to you, um, Katie, first, and then to Tanya. Oh, gosh. Um, I, that is such a good, I feel like, working within ceramics, for instance, there are like so a million ways to do it. And like just on my head right now for something I want to do today, I wanna to like experiment with trying to make some like really realistic faux marble out of clay. So that's what, nice. is, that's my answer. <laughs> that's a great answer, fantastic. Tanya, how about you? Um, I feel like I'm still not done playing with clay as well. Um, so yeah, I really, really love every single time I get to, to work with clay. And so, yeah, so I want to keep going with that too. Hmm. James, I can see you may, did you have a question there? I was just laughing when, when Katie was talking about mediums, because I also believe she's doing a whole project in cast bronze as well in Italy, which is amazing as well. You're going over there very shortly, right? Or soon. Yeah, like in uh, eight days. Oh, fantastic. Are you working with the Fondation um, uh, Battaglia there, or is it? Ah, yeah. they're great. They're absolutely beautiful. Yeah, in Milan. Yeah. I'm so excited. Also, Tanya, you should come to my studio and make something. I just got a giant kill. Ah. Oh. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Um, I have other, in fact, sorry, hang on. I'm looking now at the chat again. I'm keeping my eyes on both chat and also q and I have another question, but I'll hold it for a second because we have one through from Chloe. A uh, question for Katie, you were talking about the chaos and isolation in your artwork um, in a gallery. What would you be your perfect gallery to have artwork be in or what would that look like to you? Uh, present company excluded, our own company um, is a wonderful place to have it. But if you were thinking about a perfect setting, Oh my gosh, a perfect setting. This I feel like this is way too much pressure. I'm just gonna say outside. Right, and I, I like that that can um, funnel back into your dream and hope of a, um, a, a garden. And then um, one other question from Anahit. Um, how did you make the wicker piece and do you do all the fabrication yourself? What parts do you outsource? So thinking about process, especially um, in relation to the work that was on the slide. For me, oh, um, so the fur, I, the wicker cabinet was actually made in Newark, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, so I had like done, I actually like, my mom taught me how to weave when I was really little. And so I made these samples um, with ro rocks woven in and then I found this amazing uh, Russian fabricator 
in New York and he, they, they made it. Thanks. Um, I will keep my eye on the chat and also the Q&A um, for other questions that come to us. I think we have about three minutes left. And so I'm gonna go back to my question list. Um, James, tell me if you have any others that you would like to ask. Um, I, there were so many really big questions and, and big answers that came out of the conversation today. And I, I really could do it like another 20 minutes at least, if not like another two days to talk about some of these topics. Um, one question that I had down here, um, Tonya, I wanted to ask you a little bit, and it's because I've been working with a, a, a bunch of really fantastic colleagues on thinking about um, the arc of human reproduction, motherhood as a topic within art, design and craft. And I found when I was researching for this talk, you identify um, as an activist, but also as a mother. Um, and I was interested in that as a public identification and also the ways in which that has or has not been um, something that is welcomed in the art world, that is welcomed in, I mean, and there are multiple art worlds, right? It is no one homogenous thing, um, but had been welcomed in the scenarios in which you find yourself as a practicing artist, which I know very, very, very largely sometimes. Um, so could you speak a little bit to that? Um, yeah, I think in the beginning, um, it was harder, especially when I had a baby. Um, and, you know, when I had like an infant, a lot of the stuff was a little bit harder to get away from, um, like, you know, people constantly asking me like at an art show, like solo show, you walk in, sorry, we have so many different people texting. Um, so... <laughs> I, we yeah we're supposed to be in the middle of another meeting um anyways um but oh my god sorry that's totally fine that's good I want to stop texting sorry <laughs> um, we finish on the dot of 12 50. no 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 it's totally fine it's just we have a a, a massive uh a site-specific installation that opened on Saturday and they're having the like engineering meeting about it right now um anyways um but yeah you know solo show walk in and instead of congratulations everyone's like who's watching your baby you know and then me seeing um male colleagues same situation nobody asked them who's taking care of their baby you know really general stuff like that but also you know like pumping milk in the car on my way to teaching and then having to pump in a janitor's closet because there's no, like there's so many different things that happen, I think as a mom um, and like even, you know, like the childbirth experience, so many different things that have kind of um, like affected me in ways that I never even imagined um, that it's kind of like, I feel like at the point of me giving birth, my body became like a community body um, like I no longer had like autonomy over like my own body. And then at that point, it kind of became more open to representing so many of us, if that makes any sense to you. Um, and so then like in that way, like it really transformed my work in ways that I was able to do performance and like endurance things and a lot of stuff that, um, that, um, yeah, like I just kind of like started relating to myself very differently. Um, but then also like in terms of object and in terms of, you know, my history as a maker of furniture, um, there was also a lot of really strange times when I was like, oh, my body is a bed, my body is a table, my body is food, my body is a house, my body is like the original 3D printer, like all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, so my life and my work and, and my everything has completely transformed and gained like layers and layers of, you know, human and mammal experience um, through becoming a mother. I, want to uh, I, I will say also that I was, I was at the Art Institute of Chicago last year, pre-pandemic in the design gallery, the contemporary design gallery. And there in a case, I saw my first ever uh, breast pump that was actually part of a permanent design collection at a museum. Then I looked at the label very closely and it was donated by Michelle. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's awesome. And you know what, James? This is why I asked this question. First of all, Tanya, I wanna see that show and I will help you make that show. My body is a table, my body is a chair. Yes, amen to that. Um, and B, yeah, no, I had tried to get a breast pump in MoMA's collection, in the PMA collection. One of the questions I didn't get to ask you, Katie and Tanya was, craft and design as luxury versus craft and design as 
political object or as handmade object or as community object. Um, I was told very memorably by one director of a museum for whom I worked, uh, who shall remain nameless, um, that uh, I was obviously on the wrong track because uh, decorative art was only luxury objects, right? Um, which uh, was incredibly depressing. I no longer work at that museum. Um, but I feel so strongly about this area of, of um, human experience. And I think that goes back also, Katie, to what you were talking about in your work as well, the way in which uh, the female body or female identifying bodies, or maybe just people with internal reproductive organs, are such contested geographies and spaces, um, and yet almost never have seen themselves represented, at least in the material culture collections that I was um, taking care of. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's why I ended up uh, very kindly, the folks at the Chicago Art Institute um, uh, put that on display, an Agnell pump from the 50s and then a, a contemporary example from today. But um, yeah, I, I wish there was more conversation like that. And maybe it would happen if museums and curators, instead of saying, this is what the idea is, came to artists and asked, what is it that you don't get to do? What is it that would be helpful to your practice? How can our conservators think about the materials that you work in? And maybe not preserving them for forever, maybe that's not the point here, um, but what, what knowledge bases that you have and we have, how could they be mutually beneficial in ways that were truly radical? Um, yeah, that maybe is a good place to end. Uh, Tanya and Katie, thank you. I admire your practice so much. Tanya, I hope you can get to your engineering meeting and at least get to the end of it. Congratulations on your work. Katie, congratulations on all the work that you're doing as well, the exhibitions that are coming up for you both. And James, congratulations on your amazing Objects USA show and thanks for having us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye now. <laughs>